right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nairi Woods. I direct the Global Economic Governance Program here at Oxford <coughs> University. And I'm chairing the first two of these three panels, which have been put together for today by Sabina Alkiri, who's sitting on my right, um, and her initiative, whose handsome banner you can see to her right. Today happens to be World Philosophy Day, and I thought that was quite appropriate, although I only discovered this this morning. That, um, but World, World Philosophy Day, UNESCO tells us, has an aim of bringing philosophy closer to everyone, academics, students, and the general public alike, to, to show the new opportunities and space that exist for philosophical reflection, critical thinking, and debate. And I actually <laughs> thought that was a very appropriate day for this panel to be held. And for all of us to have this opportunity to debate about and with Amartya Sen. Professor Sen will be joining us in 10 or 15 minutes, um, lest you're wondering about the empty chair on the far right. And he's surely known to everyone in this room. He's the Thomas W. Lamont University Professor of economics and philosophy at Harvard University and a fellow of Trinity College. He has over 80 honorary doctorates, so you're never wrong if you call him Dr. Sen. <laughs> He's known to us all for his contributions to welfare economics, for which he was awarded <coughs> the Nobel Prize, as well as in human development, poverty, gender, gender inequality, and political li liberalism. But Amartya Sen is something else, as well as a philosopher, and that is that he's an activist, a quiet activist, most surely, and to quote one of the reviews of his book, an exquisitely civilized activist, Lord Desai once said of Amartya Sen that he prefers to be subversive in a technical way, and Amartya's own response to this was telling, he said that his activism puts technical and mathematical arguments <coughs> at the disposal of the causes of activists. That it's driven by his belief that reasoning can help any cause. The questions that he's put to us in his powerful new book, I think, pose three big questions about how it is that economics helps us to think about public life. The first is about how the world actually works and the extent to which he would argue we need to open up economics if it's to help us to understand how the world works. The second is to what we should aspire, what are our goals and what are our ideals? And to what extent does economics as a normative science help us to set those goals or to limit them. And the third is the best way to achieve our goals and how it is that we need to open up economics in order <coughs> for it to do a better job at prescribing policies and solutions. In these ways, in his presentation of how we can better understand the world, of how we can better set goals for human society and how we can better achieve those goals, his impact on economics, social science, public policy has been huge. And today we're going to be exploring this through three panels. In the first panel, we're going to be looking at the first of those questions really, and about to what extent economics helps us to understand the world around us, and to what extent it's poised to change at this particular moment. And I'm delighted to have three panelists, <coughs> I was gonna say at least one of whom is an activist, <laughs> to, de to debate this. The first is Dr. Sabina Alkiri, who has been the driving force behind all of these events. 
She's director of the Oxford Policy and Human Development Initiative at Oxford. And that initiative is very much inspired by Amartya Sen's capability approach to development. What Sabine is doing in her initiative is defining and applying new ways to measure poverty, human development, and welfare. Her own book, Valuing Freedoms, Sen's Capability Approach and Poverty Reduction, will show you how she does this analytically and intellectually, how she takes us into the world of the way in which human beings, in fact, make value judgments, including in her own work in South Asia and beyond. And Sabina will kick off today's panel discussion. Speaking second will be Professor, Professor Avna Offer, who's sitting first on my left here, Professor of Economic History here at Oxford. Avna's most recent book, The Challenge of Affluence, Self-Control and Well-Being in the United States and Britain since 1950, represents a quiet, powerful challenge to conventional economics because he argues that well-being and affluence are not increasing in the same measure. That well-being has lagged behind increasing affluence. He'll speak himself, but I, the quote I love from your book, Avner, is, affluence breeds impatience, and impatience undermines well-being. He can explain this in his comments today. And finally, Angus Ritchie, sitting on the far left, is, as it were, our activist on today's panel. He's been an Anglican priest ministering in East London and an active congregational leader in the group London Citizens for the past decade. Angus's work focuses on building just communities through congregational involvement in citizen organizing. He's currently involved in campaigns for the living wage and for ethical guarantees for London's Olympic bid. He's also doing a doctorate at Magdalen College where he is a chaplain. So we have a rich group of panelists. We have Amartya joining us when he gets here to pick up the conversation. The panelists have agreed to speak for eight <coughs> minutes each. They have begged me to stop them the minute they get to eight minutes. As their servant, I will do so. And that will then give us plenty of time for you to throw in your questions. And I know you will also beg me to stop you if your question becomes a little long. So regretfully, I'll, I'll do that for you. So let's start with Sabina. Thank you very much. The Idea of Justice is not a book about economics. But upon its publication, readers immediately started to make connections between the two. Tony Atkinson uh, planned a talk entitled Public Economics After the Idea of Justice and is teaching on the book now. Nick Stern, in his August presidential address to the European Economic Association, commended Sen's book as articulating the objectives of public policy. And others such as James Purnell, David Miliband, and Liam Byrne in the UK have drawn upon this book when discussing economics. And that is the motivation for this panel. The round table provides a space to ponder two questions. First, should economists engage with these core ideas? And second, what practical implications would the engagement have for teaching, research, policy, but above all, as Angus will elaborate more, for our strategic engagement across different interest groups? <coughs> the idea of justice is a rich text to which no summary will do justice. And in case you haven't thoroughly digested it, um, it has three overarching themes that do not do justice to it. First, comparative assessments in a second best world. Our aim in this sordid and messy world is to identify and choose by discussion and analysis and steely realism the least worst option. Second, people's lives and capabilities. The game is not over when we have GDP growth or sound economic governance, but only when people are flourishing. And third, comprehensive outcomes. 
how outcomes were generated also matters. Processes <coughs> and principles such as efficiency, equity, respect for human rights, and responsibility must be considered alongside incentives and information and outcomes. Many hear in these three ideas a call to reestablish the normative foundations for economic policy, a 21st century welfare economics by whatever name. It was published at a time when many across the political and professional spectrum argue that economics is poised to change anyway. The October 2009 newsletter of the Royal Economic Society points out that the impact of the recession among economists might last much longer than the recession itself. I would like to mention three key areas where this popular introspective discussion about economics has taken off. First, economists need to have in view the bigger picture. In that presidential address to the EEA, Nick Stern said, if you look at the giants of our profession, many of them strode across it. All were capable and talk of thinking and talking about different parts of the economy <coughs> at the same time. And while Stern spoke of economics in general, Besley and Hennessy and other economists prepared a letter to the Queen responding to her pointed question, why didn't economists anticipate the financial crisis? Their central conclusion is this, and I quote, the failure was principally a failure of the collective imagination to understand the risks to the system as a whole. Simply put it, put, economists frequently lost sight of the bigger picture. So Sen's idea of justice is commending a comprehensive evaluation of states of affairs and seeing how choice facts fit in to a larger picture. The second is for economics to <coughs> re-establish its links to human well-being. Tony Atkinson's splendid article, The Strange Disappearance of Welfare Economics, points out that those proposing specific macroeconomic policies often cannot tell you how these will impact people's lives. Social objectives are rarely made explicit or even thought through. And while the word welfare has faded from affection, the need for a clear moral basis for economics and policy has not. For example, President Sarkozy asked Amartya and Joe Stiglitz to re lead the recent commission for the measurement of economic <coughs> performance and social progress. The uptake of that report demonstrates the public hunger for economics to recover its link to well-being. As Stiglitz wrote in his FT piece, hopefully, the work of our commission will have increased the impetus to align the metrics of well-being with what really contributes to the quality of life, and in so doing, help us direct our efforts to those things that really matter. So here's a question. A lot of you are studying PPE. Do you feel that studying philosophy and economics helps you work on the things that really matter? Could you recommend how France should change its metrics for GDP or quality of life? It's not only Atkinson, Solo, and Stern who want these things taught. In Germany, 88 prof professors of economics raised a public petition to do so because, they argued, the systematic analysis of issues of economic policy without a normative foundation <coughs> is not possible. So teaching the idea of justice in PPE might not only engage philosophers with economics, the overt agenda of the book, it might also engage economists with the welfare basis of policy evaluations. Finally, I don't know how to put this, but in some way, ideology needs reasons and methods. As a postgraduate student here, the economics I learned was, I now see, ideologically charged. And there is a disaffection at present, though, with unreflected ideology in favor of economists who solve problems in Amartya's second best world, who are more empirically grounded and make normative claims explicit. <coughs> 
For example, Asimoglu wrote of economists, almost in uh, self-criticism, we let policymakers' policies and rhetoric set the agenda for our thinking about the world, and perhaps worse, for our policy advice. Nick Stern went so far as to reverse Keynes' quote and claim that in recent times, economists have been the slave of defunct politicians. And in an AEA piece, Greg Mankiw revived Sain's wistful hope that economists might be humble and competent, like dentists. <laughs> so from these internal discussions and soul-searching reflections, it seems economics is poised to change. Within a decade, it will be different. Economists working in public economics and policy have a time, an opportunity to draw into our analysis behavioral economics, theories of justice and empowerment, game theory, institutional economics, and political economy. But the concrete paths forward simply are not clear to me, strategically. Many scientists work together on genetic, genetic mapping or in building clean energies. Could economists work together and with activists and political groups to flesh out some of the proposals we admire in Sen's idea of justice? I think it's worth a try. Thank you. Afnan. Yes, thank you. Uh, the call for uh, opening up economics suggests that uh, the model is incomplete. Uh, now, economists tell us that uh, if the model omits a crucial variable, then that imparts a bias to the result, or in ordinary words, uh, you get it wrong. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about one of these omitted variables, uh, I have one other omitted variable, but I won't talk about it. Uh, one omitted variable, and uh, that is ethics. Uh, and the question is how to do it, how do we incorporate this variable? Uh, so I'm going to uh, try to do it, uh, and there's a bit of a bias uh, from my discipline. So uh, put on your seat belts, we're taking off. Uh, <laughs> First, uh, the first point to make is that if we have bad theory, that begets bad policy. That is really a concern. That is the concern. Uh, and I'm going to start by reaching out of economics to social psychology, where they have a concept called just world theory. What is a just world theory? A just world theory is a theory that tells you that everyone gets what they deserve. Uh, now, the world is full of just world theories. For example, the Counter-Reformation and the Inquisition had uh, a view of the world, and uh, they burnt heretics at the stake because that is what they deserved. Uh, now, there are quite a few other such just world theories. Think, for example, of Bolshevism. Or actually, I think the Rawlsian system is also a just world theory. Uh, <laughs> Neoclassical economics looks a bit like a just world theory, and classical liberalism is a just world theory, uh, say the Milton Friedman kind of uh, classical liberalism. Why is it a just world theory? Because it privileges freedom, and it takes initial endowments, what people bring to the market, as irrelevant. So, and uh, more radical thinkers say that uh, what people bring to uh, the market is legitimate. And one of Sen's innovation is actually to query this neglect uh, of initial endowments. So how do we criticize a just world theory? Uh, that immediately presents us with the central problem of ethics, which is that it is impossible to agree on the nature of the good. There are good arguments uh, for different visions of the good. So perhaps we solve this problem by seeking agreement on what constitutes the bad. How do we avoid the bad? Maybe we can reach agreement more easily that way. And so I'd like to propose a parsimonious criterion of the bad. And that criterion is do not cause unwarranted pain or death. Do not cause unwarranted pain or death. Uh, I think it's 
difficult to disagree with this because what would you say? Now, do cause un uh, unwarranted pain or death? So it's difficult to disagree with this, but I think the focus uh, is on the warrant. What is it in the theory that warrants the infliction of pain or death? Uh, and when we come to that problem, we have to reach out uh, to our moral intuitions, or perhaps as uh, Amartya Sen likes to do, he invites the impartial spectator to uh, express an opinion uh, on this. At any rate, there's something to discuss. We have a criterion and we have a theory and we can engage in reasonable discussion whether the infliction of pain and death is warranted or not by the theory in question. Uh, now, this criterion, I argue, uh, does a lot with a little, not only in ethics, but also in economics. And so let's have a little exercise, uh, and we'll apply this to the field of American healthcare, which is in the news at the moment. So what we have there is a clash of ethics. Uh, on the one hand, we have the medical ethic. The medical ethic says do no harm. Uh, so the duty of care is on the provider. Then there's a the market liberal ethic. What does the market liberal ethic say? It says, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. So this is uh, the opposite view. The duty of care is on the recipient, not on the provider. Uh, medics have an asymmetry of knowledge with everybody else. They know how to heal and we don't know how well they know. Uh, and that gives them uh, considerable market power. Uh, and when I talk about medics here, I talk both about the medical professionals and the person who sell their products, in other words, the insurers. Uh, now, we say that their commitment to the principle of do no harm can make us tolerate their market power, or perhaps even justify their market power. But that type of professional ethic uh, came into conflict with market liberalism. So the two in the 70s, uh, these two ethics came into conflict with each other, and uh, market liberals regarded ethical codes as restraints on trade. And in 1975, uh, there's an American Supreme Court case, Goldfarb versus Virginia State Bar, which isn't even about medicine. It's about the law. But what it decided was that uh, professionals were uh, not immune to antitrust. In other words, they were merchants like anyone else and should behave like merchants. As a consequence, now you could say uh, there are various arguments for competitive markets and so on. They may or may not increase human welfare. Uh, so, but the consequence of this was that ethical constraints were removed, and this is reflected in the ethical codes of the professional associations, but the market power was not removed because the medics still remained in command of their market power. And what has happened in the States is that the market power of the medics has driven up costs to the point of macroeconomic disorder. So what we see here is a neglect of a fairly parsimonious principle. Ethical principle can lead to a major macroeconomic disorder, uh, and the other thing is that the exclusion of people from medical markets also had the eff effect of inflicting uh, pain and death, warranted the infliction of pain and death. Uh, and this was warranted by the market liberal doctrine of freedom, and I use that term in quotes. Uh, it's interesting that the current healthcare reform movement in the United States is driven more by ethical revulsion at exclusion than by the rising cost. In fact, it, I think it almost completely fails to address the issue of market power. Uh, but I think it's a demonstration of how ethical neglect can lead to bad policies. And I think I'll stop here, but before I stop, I'll say not only in health, and not only in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Angus Ritchie. Yeah. What kind of agreement can be hammered out 
when you bring together the director of East London Mosque, some local parish priests, and the rabbi of Europe's oldest synagogue. You might fear such diverse communities would only manage to agree on the banal, the blindingly obvious. If you add into the mix an atheist trade union leader, a head teacher, the director of a housing charity, you would think that the scope for substantive agreement would be even narrower. But that's exactly the mix that London Citizens brings together. Next Wednesday, there will be 2,000 people from that range of institutions gathering <coughs> in the Barbican Hall, negotiating with the Mayor of London, the government minister responsible for the Olympics and other political and financial leaders. The work of this alliance tests a central idea in Professor Sen's book. London Citizens invites those of us who live in inner city neighborhoods to put aside the issues on which we disagree and instead to focus on the injustices that are evident to all. And it seems to work. Its living wage campaign, to take just one example, has won 25 million pounds more for the lowest paid workers in the capital. Wednesday's assembly will focus on the credit crunch, calling for an extension of the living wage and a new deal on responsible lending and borrowing. And the financial crisis has indicated some of the strengths and weaknesses of progressive politics in Britain. Indeed, it's striking to contrast the political debate today with the state of play in the 1970s amidst another economic crisis. In a paper we wrote in 2007, Sabina Alkair and I looked back on that period and argued that those working on Sen's capability approach had much to learn from the highly strategic architects of free market economics. When crisis struck, they were ready at hand with a bold and accessible analysis of what had gone wrong and some clear policy prescriptions for the future. The ascent of free market ideas was no coincidence. As we argued in that paper, their rise was the result of decades of focused and effective organizing. Back in 1950, Friedrich Hayek's views had made him unemployable in many economics faculties. By 1974, he had received a Nobel Prize. In the 80s, his policy prescriptions were a key inspiration for the Thatcher and Reagan governments. In between those dates, there had been a concerted mobilization. Hayek and others on the right constructed a compelling moral and practical narrative. They developed a community of ideas. They fostered talent, both junior and senior. They were strategic about the dissemination of ideas, targeting what Hayek called the intellectuals, those who had com can communicate a narrative to a mass audience. So in that sense, he took journalists to be intellectuals. And when the crisis came, they had well-developed and well-communicated policy prescriptions. A key part of that was the Montpellerin Society, founded by Hayek as an international community of scholars and intellectuals, as a means of developing the vision of free market economics and a way of disseminating it in the wider culture. <coughs> the story of this society illustrates another component of the free marketeers' success. They'd thought about economic vested interests securing funding from those who shared their values and especially those who would benefit from their policy prescriptions and sometimes those two groups overlapped. Such funding paid for the activities of the society. It also endowed chairs in economics and created institutions such as the Foundation for Economics Education. Our argument was and is that such organizing is needed today. An extraordinary feature of the political debate in the aftermath of the credit crunch is the lack of a clear narrative, a story which blends the moral and the empirical to make sense of this world and to work out how to change it for the better. There are, of course, other great differences between the 1970s and our own time. On the positive side, domestic and global poverty are high on the agenda for all the main political parties in Britain. That's evident from the political breadth of today's panels and in the language now being used by the Conservative Party. David Cameron remarked early in his leadership 
that it's time we admitted there is more to life than money. It's time we focus not just on GDP, but on general well-being. And just last week in his Hugo Young lecture, he drew an explicit link between well-being and the distribution as well as the amount of wealth. On the negative side, though, is the sheer complexity of contemporary economics and the related tendency for economists to focus on very specific and detailed areas of research. There's an urgent need for joined up research on how we operationalize the vision of an economic system founded on expanding capabilities rather than simply maximizing per capita GDP. We need effective measures of this new goal. We need to understand the range of policies which might help us achieve it. In terms of the credit crunch then, this isn't just about avoiding another meltdown. We're talking about a fundamental refocusing of economics on enhancing human security and flourishing. The opportunity of our time lies in the appetite for change, for policies driven by a wider conception of human well-being. The danger is that our appetite remains just that, a hope, a need, an aspiration. At the very moment when every politician is talking about social justice, we're way off course on the poverty reduction targets which have been agreed, the UK Child Poverty Pledge and the UN Millennium Development Goals. So there's a challenge for all of us who share Professor Sen's vision, all of us who recognize it to be, yes, humane and compelling, but also incredibly urgent. The challenge for us all, the students, academics, policymakers here present, is to mobilize, to secure the resources for the research, to be strategic about the nurturing of talent and the communication of ideas, and to recognize that real transformation requires the communities who bear the brunt of injustice to organize together for change. So our speakers have led us into a huge, important debate. <coughs> Sabina had us peep into the economist's toolkit and pointed out that welfare economics seems strangely to have disappeared, that economists now look like slaves of defunct politicians. She challenged us right here in Oxford to start by rethinking the tools you learn as a PPEist. And Avner then picked up and warned us of the dangers of neglecting ethics and proper ethical inquiry not just in training and in, and in thinking, but in policy. He showed us a medical system which he said warrants death and pain as a result of its neglect of ethics and in the name of freedom. And I think Angus then took us right into the world of what mobilization means, not just because mobilization is a way to achieve goals, but in a very Sen-like way, pointing out to us that deliberation, debate, and public engagement is a way to build a sense of what's just, is a way to build a shared idea of justice. So we've got three quite big parts of this equation <coughs> introduced to us. And can I now call on you to bring questions, comments um, to, the, to the discussion? I'm sorry, sorry. Could, could, could you stand up and just give us the question once again, speaking straight okay. into the microphone? And my name's Tom, I probably shouldn't say that, and I'm an undergraduate. Um, the Thank you. Reverberating with agreement from other sides of the hall. I'm going, to take a, I'm going to take three or four questions and then have our panelists answer them. Up, 
up here. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm in the second year. So my, my name is Rithik and I'm in the second year MPhil. And Professor Offer said that, you know, the ethics is the, the missing ver uh, variable in our models. So in the current discourse of economics, how, how do we make ethics an included variable? So how, how do we make ethics an included variable in economics? Is that second question. Do we have over here? Hi, my name is Harpreet. I'm MPhil first year student in economics. My question was, uh, how do we reconcile climate change with the idea of justice? Uh, considering that, for example, developed countries, after they put a cap on carbon trade, uh, people in developed countries will still emit more carbon per capita as compared to people in developing countries. So how, does, how do you even have the idea of justice and at the same time control climate change because you need to control the carbon uh, emissions? Right. So how we reconcile climate change and justice. And a fourth question over there. Hi, um, I'm Lisa. I studied economics and philosophy. And what I found economists to object to when I told them that I study philosophy is that that's not science. That about, that's about values. I think we need to find a new way of thinking about economics that is both scientific but not value-free in the sense that excludes ethics. And I was wondering what you would suggest for this. Thank you. Right, so quite a strong demand by students for rethinking the syllabus. Um, <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> and because here in Oxford we have very simple, straightforward governance procedures, I'm sure we can do it right here. <laughs> Um, so, well, Sabina, would you like to kick off with, um, <coughs> with how we reconcile climate change and justice? That's the question I saw you writing down, but not your fellow panelists. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to suggest it be asked in the next panel where somebody will be speaking on climate change. <laughs> there we go. So, there's an advertisement for the next session. I, but uh, to Lisa and, and, and also... Well, particularly in, in answer to your question, there are different interesting interventions from different part breeds of economists on science versus engineering. So David Colander on the art of economics, or Greg Mankiw on economists as scientists and engineers. And um, the recognition is that in some cases, theory-driven an analysis has not proven to be useful for policy. And so that means both doing empirical work that um, is differently shaped, what Mankiw would call engineering, um, and then also what, yeah, David Collender argues is that we, we had positive and normative economics, but we also have lost what was called the art of economics, how it can be applied in, in real world situations. So it's interesting just to read people from different parts of the spectrum trying to rethink what is the, the role of empirical work and, and how is theory uh, uh, negatively affected the empirical work that we do and so caused us to overlook some things that we might wish to look at more carefully. Right, but, but Sabina, is there, a, is there a fear that if you're an economist and you start embracing the normative questions that Lisa's raising, you end up being fluffy? Yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fear, I think, both that the tools may not be so well developed and so you need to have more... Uh, methodological work to think through to tough questions like, well, multidimensional well-being or poverty is one we work on, but actually thinking this through quite carefully, if that's your objective rather than something unidimensional, then how actually do you try to affect all these interconnected things at the same time? So there are a lot of hard questions that come up when you uh, introduce certain normative features. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's also a cultural uh, aspect uh, that economists want to be seen as scientists. Professor Sen, we're delighted to have you with us. <laughs> we have saved for you all the difficult questions. <laughs> I think uh, one of the students present asked you, how do you make ethics a variable in economics? 
Well, I think that uh, rational choice has a lot to answer for here. Uh, this is, uh, you know, economists might like to, to talk about science, but uh, the assumption that the only obligation I have is only towards myself is a fairly arbitrary assumption. Uh, it might have been justified 30 years ago by the claim of superior results, but uh, I think that over time these results have, uh, to put it mildly, have not been delivered. Uh, in addition, the, uh, by the way, I think uh, especially young people underestimate the novelty of this doctrine, which kind of sprang, uh, sprang on the world in the 19, effectively in the 1960s and the 1970s and swept across uh, some of the social sciences, not all of them. Uh, part of the reform movement is taking place within economic itself, economics itself, in which economists are saying, let's not make assumptions about uh, what people want, uh, let's investigate what they want, and that's the movement for behavioral economics. What behavioral economics has found is that people have moral intuitions, which they are willing to act on, which they're willing to make sacrifices for, now, this is one of the omitted variables I, I was talking about. So if you exclude uh, motives, if you exclude a variable from your model, you're likely to get the wrong results. Uh, what you lose uh, by uh, introducing uh, reality or experience is what you lose is a so-called rigor, but uh, being precisely wrong, I don't think is, uh, all that attractive. Uh, <coughs> and so I think that there's hope within economics itself. And I, I do reject this idea of fluffiness. And I think that Adam Smith would have rejected it as well. Because at the very birthplace of economics, and perhaps at the highest point it has ever reached, uh, <laughs> Smith, was, Smith was perfectly aware that uh, thinking about how to maximize welfare or well-being could not exclude ethical considerations. Um, Professor Sen, a number of the audience have <coughs> asked questions about um, how you can bring normative values into economics, about how you can make ethics a variable, how you can reform the way you teach economics to open up the realm of justice and values. And that's how we got into this discussion about whether economists are afraid to do so because they <coughs> might appear fluffy. I wonder if you've got any comments, particularly for the um, students, the graduates and undergraduates in this hall, about how to reconcile these, these two. Uh, uh, is this on or? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, well, I, 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 I'm first of all, my apologies. I came from Cambridge and I had to do a few things <laughs> before coming here. Um, the, uh, and I got delayed and I missed uh, the presentation. Uh, the, um, uh, I don't know what there, there is to reconcile. I mean, that's the nature of the subject matter, isn't it? I mean, economics is concerned with, uh, if you, if you, even if you, I think, Smith was being mentioned. Even if you're talking about wealth of nations, you're, you're not saying the title isn't wealth of the individual or anything like that. Uh, I mean, there is aggregates are what economics has always been concerned with. There isn't much to reconcile. The only question would have been, and there I, <coughs> I think you're probably giving more ground than I would have, namely that it looks on the basis of some result that one might have only responsibility <laughs> to oneself, I would have interpreted those claims to those results, and certainly that's the way all those people who presented the results, whether it be earlier generation um, uh, Marshall and Hicks or Samuelson or later generation uh, Arrow de Beau, presented it is that a good way of doing your responsibilities to society is to pursue those duties which you feel associate with your own pursuit of your preferences. 
and if there wasn't a claim that there isn't a social responsibility, it was an instrumental argument that pursuing individual objectives can do wonderful things. Now, then again, none of them really absolutely believed in it. Um, if, we, if today I have to say why, what's gone wrong with the market economy in the, in the, in the kind of meltdown that we watched, uh, I think the two main factors would be um, the way, um, uh, three main factors would be the way um, our lives are interdependent, the subject on which Pigou was very concerned, the way public goods are extremely important, in which some of the classic papers were written by Paul Samuelson, and the way there are asymmetric information, and that there's a lot that we don't know, on which Kenneth Arrow in 73 made, the, uh, made a major contribution in the context of its application to medical care. So I think, and these are meant to be the authors of these ways, results. I mean, what they did was to say that with, in the presence of some assumptions, which are the following, uh, we will get these results, and then they proceeded typically to question those assumptions. So I don't think this, this and I, I don't think the, the, the kind of question which is reflected in reconciliation is a question that would have appeared natural to anyone other than in the last two or three decades, really. I mean, it's an unnatural question in economics. That's not what the subject is about when people worried about uh, Sir John Stuart Mill scaring everyone by lecturing on political economy. Uh, the idea wasn't that he was advising how best to make investments. He was advising on how, what to do about the political economy of his country and uh, how the lives would go. And Smith, of course, is not only, he was aware, as, as I think uh, Adma said, um, that, um, that, was, that that was the subject of his book. <laughs> and, and the theory of moral sentiment, which by the way, this is a great occasion. This is the 250th anniversary of the theory of moral sentiment published in 1769. I'm very privileged that the anniversary edition has a long introduction from me uh, by Peng, uh, about to be published by Penguin next month in December, uh, where I discuss the relation between, sorry, and this is a bit of a commercial, but <laughs> this is uh, where I discuss the relationship between the theory of moral sentiments and wealth of nations, and why people have some difficulty following what the hell wealth of nation is saying. Where did these prodigals and projectors came from who were messing up the world of the 18th century economics in the way that AIG and and other organizations have done recently. Um, I think you have to see quite a lot of the theory of moral sentiment. And Smith went on saying, as he went on producing, the, the sequence of it's quite interesting, since Smith is very central, I think. 1759, 250 years ago, he published his first book. Then he said there are some instrumental issues to be pursued, and comes the wealth of nations. And, and then finally, then when, when the last edition of it comes in 1790 of the theory of moral sentiment before it dies in the something called the advertisement. At the beginning he mentions that I made a promise to go into the old instrumental questions also and to some extent I fulfilled that in that book which it took to be a relatively minor book namely the wealth of nations. So that's the way uh, Smith saw his whole project. It's not a, uh, I mean if I, I, I'm, I'm being I'm agreeing with you even more than you are yourself by, this <laughs> <way>. <laughs> by saying that um, I mean, that was the project in which Smith felt he was really engaged. So I, I think, um, you know, I think I'm very keen on answering questions which I understand and see where they're coming from. In this case, it seems to be coming from a conclusion. Thank you I'm not much. attributing anyone who asked the question, conclusion. But they're taking the conclusion seriously. That's the, that's the judge. <laughs> as one of your reviewers um, put it, I think they've described you as exquisitely civilized in your agreements and disagreements. <laughs> but Professor Sen, I think we all just learned an exquisite way to disagree, which is I'm agreeing with you even more than you are <laughs> with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a... It's a 
a grace and a courtesy that the rest of us aspire to unsuccessfully. Um, Angus Ritchie, did you want to answer to some of these questions? Yeah, just a couple of comments, really. Um, I mean, I think the heart of ethics <coughs> is the question of what it is to be human, what, what it is to be a flourishing human being. And I think, as, as I say, I'm saying, this isn't a question of bringing normativity uh, into ethics. It's also partly about bringing to the surface the normative assumptions that um, are already there when they're not articulated, and then, and then exploring whether they're right. And I suppose in a kind of modest way, something like the Living Wage Campaign has, has done that. There's a set of assumptions about what human beings are like, what incentives will make them work well. And we've um, we certainly found that employers who might have started off with a model where driving down wage costs was the best thing to do have <coughs> been surprised to find that having been lobbied to take some normative questions into account, it's actually turned out to be more practically effective. So I suppose one, one question there is, where are the hidden assumptions about how human beings what human beings are like and what makes them flourish that are buried in allegedly norms of the economics. In terms of rewriting the PPE syllabus, um, I think just one, one comment would be, it's always, as, as someone who went through a bit of it, um, who is assumed to be the actor in politics? Um, is, is, I, mean, I think the kind of, let's work out the, you know, the ideal theory and then let's apply it assumes that, that there's fundamentally one monolithic actor here, and I think politics is uh, a lot more interesting than that. Thank you very much. Well, at this point, we're going to change panelists. Um, so can we thank three of our four panelists and welcome to the stage the next three.